Welcome to Cartoonist Cafe. My name is Ed Piscor. And I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics and Fantastic Four Grand Design. Today we're going to be taking a look at Michael Golden's Micronauts Artist Edition. Uh, but first, I want to invite you guys to like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. And that helps mitigate the kayfabe effect, which is what happens whenever we talk about a book that uh, might not have the biggest print run comes prohibitively expensive on the aftermarket by uh, end of day, the day our videos go live. So the people who see the videos earliest have first dibs in uh, scooping up the comics and books and magazines that we talk about. Also, if you watch these videos to the end, that pushes our, com our comic book content out to other YouTube uh, lovers of comic books, helps us grow our subscriber base, and uh, we appreciate that very much. Michael Golden's Micronauts. Tom, man, this is the, uh, this is the secret sauce uh, for, you know, Image Comics circa 1991, like all of the founding fathers, the, the name Michael Golden would come up routinely uh, in interviews with those fellas. And uh, the Michael Golden comics that I had uh, that were pretty abundant were uh, the NOM until, mm -hmm. until later yeah. when I finally started to be piece together this run of, uh, of Micronauts comics. So very cool to have the chance to look at a heap of original art scans. We did a video of... Uh, using the uh, G.I. Joe yearbook number two, uh, the the portfolio yeah. edition. And one of the things that we make note of is just like the precision mm -hmm. of this guy's artwork. Uh, I think we're here to tell that he has some kind of like a photographic kind of memory that probably aids in drawing his tanks and right, yeah. Baron Zarda or whatever or, that guy's name or is. Or even like a, a push lawnmower on the cover. Like <laughs> right. the, the gears and stuff on there look... That, that's tricky stuff to draw and he's kind of handling it in a loose way and it, it's all coming together. Yeah. So very much looking forward to this thing. Table of contents begins with Mike and Rod's 3, 7, 8, 9, 11, 12 and uh, what, some bonus material? Yeah, it's this is kind of a weird... Uh, artist edition because like I like to read artist editions and in this one it's like they're grouped in a weird way like they have a bunch of pages from issue one they have a bunch of pages from issue two but they've saved those for the back matter so like if you want and start the thing with issue three so if you want to like read it as a comic you got to kind of skip around which I, which I which I did and it it worked out fine but it just I I don't understand the decision there I, I guess maybe it's like the definition of like what an artist edition is versus you know those other designations they have like artisan edition or whatever right. I don't know if that that was what did it but Joseph Rubenstein on inks for this issue yeah you get a closer look at everything and and those um, old Micronauts issues had like some of like the really um, I wouldn't call it bad printing but it's like extremely unfaithful to the original line work, which I think produces like a really nice aesthetic at the end of the day. But if you want to see the lines that were like really on the page for the, this one, this this is a good good thing to have. He's such a precise artist as well. Uh, now it is being softened by the Joseph Rubenstein inks and everything, but uh, it's, it's still kind of all here. Uh, I would say though that even though Micronauts is cited in a big way by McFarlane and Liefeld mm -hmm. and those guys, this is still very early golden. It, it it is like it looks earlier than it is because it it looks like an immature artist, like like that he hasn't fully become who he is. But he's actually done some things prior to this at yeah. DC that are m more sort of mature golden. So might might be the inks, might yeah. be deadlines. You know, the deadline crunch. It might be a lot of things. Not known as a fast artist, and this right. is, and this was uh, he was signed up for a year. Yeah, for like just normal comics, just you know your 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 Joe freelancer doing doing your penciling duties. And it's a toy line thing, man, yeah. which was always the, a bottom of the barrel job. For, sure, for uh, for the cartoonists out there, man. Uh, you are right though. The Michael Golden uh, like Batmite uh, mm -hmm. this ba backup story and stuff is like very much cited by the image dudes. There's moments. There's moments where you see like the the full Michael Golden, but it's it's you know a lot harder to see the real guy in these kind of pull pullback shots. And I mean, I I probably said it in our other Micronauts video, but like there's way better drawn Michael Golden comics. But for me, this is my favorite. Like to to me, this is one of the great comics of all time. And and uh, you're a Mantlo fan? Yeah, I I, I am uh, of this particular work. I th I think it's more it's less Mantlo. 
uh, Golden did a lot of co-plotting on this, mm-hmm. and you kind of see it when when Golden leaves. Yeah, the 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 wheels come right off. Like it, it just doesn't work anymore once Golden leaves. Seen it on a couple previous pages, man, where Rubenstein is using the thumbprint, you know, the finger painting trick yeah. with the ink to to communicate the smoke. Yeah, and um, Rubenstein's like you know sort of like rougher, quicker, kind of, you know, gestural kind of inker. Maybe not the best fit for Michael Golden, but again, like. The masterpieces in comics that I find again and again aren't like the most, uh, you know, perfectly rendered comics. It's ones that do have sort of a rough and tumble quality to them. Those those early Spider Mans, you know, stuff like that. It's not the original, but but I think that uh, this might be purely golden. On, yeah, the covers the here. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, like like that's when he had that. Yeah. Very ornate uh, s- signature. Time to pay some bills. Ed Piscor and I are working cartoonists. The best way to support Cartoonist Kayfabe? Buy our comic books. Red Room, Trigger Warnings. Issues 1 through 3 now available in comic shops everywhere, barring uh, 28 countries and I think 11 comic shops where it's banned. But you can ask for this and order it from virtually any comic shop. Who knows, they might pull them out from under the covers. Red Room, Trigger Warnings 3, the second season of Red Room. Every Red Room cover self-contained, so pick up whichever one you find and you'll get a complete story along with Red Room. Anti-Social Network, the trade paperback of the first season, available now wherever books and comics are sold. Hulk Grand Design, Monster Madness, a retelling of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk. I am writing, drawing, coloring, lettering, the whole shebang, the Grand Design way. And this is available now in comic shops everywhere. Both issues, the complete story of the Incredible Hulk's rich history. Pick that up now wherever comics are sold. And back to our regular scheduled programming. Yeah, it is really cool seeing this, this stuff close up. It's it's Rubenstein has a thick brush, mm-hmm. you know. He's got the crusty bunkers, Neil Adams, Dick Giordano kind of brush that he's applying to Michael Golden, who I think of as like pen, yeah, pen line, yeah, like laser precision. This this is wow! Isn't there a bit of Ditko in that? That is so Ditko. Yeah, that is so Ditko. And um, Ditko did did like the first uh, and the second. Micronauts annual. Mm. And that was kind of my gateway into Micronauts was like, oh, here's a cool old Ditko comic and let me check it out and then and then liking that and checking out the rest of it. This is a really interesting effect. It's not it's not a zip screen that's cutting in those whites. Uh it looks like the damn razor blade. Yeah, it's just doing a razor blade across it. Yeah. And you could see the scoring. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, this is the kind of stuff we get artist editions for, is yeah. all these like down and dirty tricks. And, and like, look at this guy, you know, like th- there's little, um, character flur- character design flourishes that you can see how they influence, uh, you know, like the image guys and, and, you know, for sure. And I'm thinking about his Bucky O'Hare work moving forward. Yeah. This is his first 10,000 hours practice or whatever. Of- yeah. It's like a kid meeting these like little space guys. And then when you see like the spaceships with these like oversized cockpits, even like, uh, you know, a couple chapters back when they had like actual like fighter jets and stuff, he kind of like plays with the scale a little bit, blows up that cockpit. So you can see a little more of what's like going on inside. Wow. Talk about scale. Like these mm-hmm. are the micro knots. So you have so much opportunity to have giant background elements, huge TVs, a physical person with these little characters like cutting over across to show that they're in the foreground. Yeah, it just works even better at this large scale. <laughs> That's a good man thing. Don't you think that Toddlebin and, and the set kind of made all other like swamp creatures kind of obsolete? <laughs> we'll have to talk about it in the swamp thing because I, I got some stuff to say about that, but yeah. Do you know these Micronauts characters off by heart? Uh, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's this guy called? That's Bug. I, I, I think his toy name is like Galactic Defender or something, but <laughs> but yeah, he's Bug. I mean, was, were these toys your era? No, they, these would be like the older kids. This was yeah. this was like you know y- your older cousins and stuff had these, and you'd hear about it. And I remember seeing like the little booklet of like all the different Micronauts toys you could get, and being real fascinated with it. But they they weren't they were they were like old old school stuff. Now these lines are uneven, and I was going to say, oh, he used a screen for that. But I'm not so sure. I think the um, like the the company that made Micronauts went out of business like, you know, two years after this. <laughs> this was like like the 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 toy itself was already kind of 
on the wane when this comic came out and then and then you know such a cool idea mm -hmm. to like get these piecemeal toys that you could then snap together with like the other sets that you get to create your own vehicles and shit yeah that's and, pretty dope yeah and that's that's become almost like like a standard thing now there, there's like he-man guys you can do that with like the ones you get in target or whatever you can do that now that's a really cool end panel. Yeah, I I bought this guy recently, the toy. Just like it's just such a cool like I just love this series and like the toy itself is so cool. He he like snaps together with a horse and becomes a centaur and stuff. Now now this is special. Yeah, with the story behind this is um when they did sort of like Baxter reprints where they'd have two issues of the Micronauts in one comic, like doing the whole series, and then so then they it had like this kind of coloring where it's like, you know, blue lines and, and painted on. And I don't know if like, I mean, this is, looks like the what, original art. That's what I'm wondering if we're looking at, if like they colored this like straight on art, or if this is like sort of a kayfabe thing where they have like the colors and then they laid it on, you know, they, they um, combine them in Photoshop or whatever. It's Steve Olaf. Steve Olaf signing it. Yeah. I don't know. This it. Now, here's the thing. Like, this white is over top of the lettering. Like, it, yeah. I'm thinking it's on the board, dude. So, maybe when they did the uh, those reprints, may maybe they shot them this way. Like, they, they just took the original art, colored it, and shot it. I, I don't know. Man, that feels like a lawless t time in yeah. comics, man. Because also, like, this is watercolor and, and wet media. So, yeah. I imagine you have to mount this board even though if it's two ply bristol that's not enough and also did you ever try to watercolor on bristol yeah and and another thing is if you're not 100 percent sure what the inker used he might be using stuff yeah. that like just turns into like a gray blotch yeah, as yeah. soon as you put any wetness over it yeah i remember dan frege he called it the spit test man where you're mm -hmm. testing out new inks you just put a little dab on your on your, your finger on your tongue like run your hand across on a piece of scrap paper and see if you can uh, do anything with that this is when the inking like switches over to to Al Milgram from Joe Rubenstein. Uh, oh, or no, uh, Bob McCloud's doing it here, and then it, it eventually becomes um, becomes Al Milgram. I see, and, and gets like I, I think um, like Shooter wanted something more Kirby esque from this, and Rubenstein wasn't delivering the Kirby esque, and, and even Golden wasn't as like they were trying to push him in a Kirby-esque direction. Right. So Al Milgram was the one who like is like, okay, you want Kirby, you got Kirby. And it gets like super like Royerish and, you know, dots and whatnot. I mentioned Bob LeCloud Cloud is embellisher, so that makes me think that it's below pencils, uh what Michael Golden is providing. Possible. I mean sometimes, you know, like Stan Lee and stuff would would use the word embellisher just as like a fancy word for anchor this is very cool like i mean you could tell that golden built those heads and stuff i forgot man uh michael Renat's eight that's the first appearance of captain universe i think it's like one of the most uh valuable of the golden run yeah and and um that's like the thing with this comic you get a real education in sort of like comic book law because there's like characters like bug they call them you know galactic defender or whatever uh, which was what the toy was but then pretty quickly they figured out okay we got to call him bug and make him a separate thing and so like marvel owns him now the people who own micronauts don't own him and then captain universe it's like we got to make it um, you know make a point to like distinguish that this is our character and this is not you know this doesn't become part of you know this your stuff <laughs> it's like they had enough history of mm -hmm. uh ip yeah that they didn't want to get burnt so I wonder who owns the the uh, the rabbit Jedi and shit from the Star Wars comics. That's yeah, that's a great co question. I, I'll I'll bet it's Lucas because I'll bet his, you know, it went his way because this is like right after Star Wars. Um, you see, there's like some extra sort of Silver Surfer squiggle that they whited out at the last minute. Yeah, or perhaps I mean they're just that's like the triceps and just some extra anatomy mm -hmm. things. Yeah, there's a little something going on over here too. You got the the winky eye. <laughs> yeah. This is kayfabe shit right here. That's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's it's like an overlay that they just blended in. Yeah, yeah. We were talking with Scott Dunbeer about some stuff, man. He he was talking about how the uh, the vellum sheets mm -hmm. have to be kind of interwoven. It has to be you sort of at the signature can't be tipped in. But these signatures are four page signatures, so like maybe it just didn't fall in line, and maybe it's was too expensive for what they deemed this book to be. Yeah. 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 They have to make like a calculation going in of like what they think it's going to do. 
Here's our, here's our, here's our Milgram. The Milgram ones, yeah. And these, these are like my favorite issues of the series when it gets like super cosmic, super Kirby, lots of, you know, armor and, and aliens and, and stuff. It's a lot of like just Golden putting in more reps also. Look look at this pencil stuff and yeah he was getting really comfortable the the whole thing really gels it's it's uh, kind of the beauty of the series and it, it's almost like the best way for things to go is it starts out and then it just gets better and better with each one and then by the end it you know you're it's it's like a home run. This is so wild. Yeah, it's man. cool really, seeing the pencils on that. I really want to know the story about that. It has to be an overlay. Yeah, and he's like drawing a pencil. I guess like they're not copying that. I'm assuming they're like the the uh, people who do the color steps now have to like redo that with like a blade. You know, he like I asked him about stuff like his GI Joe covers and things, and I got the impression that he cut some separations yeah. himself, or drew on the magenta layer, mm -hmm. or he had some hand in production. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, these nice tall panels, seeing, you know, all this, like, apocalyptic action going on. Balls to the walls, man. Milgram's bringing a very interesting set of marks with these horizontals and verticals. It's not, it's not hatching. Yeah. And it's, it's, I don't think it's pen either. It's like he's putting those marks in with a brush. His, his inking feels like half Ditko, half Kirby. Yeah, that's a good way like, to put that. It's just like Marvel. <laughs> this girl's so dated. Well, it's yeah, so Farrah Far Far Fawcett. Fawcett. Yeah, and, and uh, Dazzler, <laughs> you know. And, uh, yeah, great hair. The close-ups and stuff are, are where you see, like, the pure golden. Like, her, her face and her eyes are, like, so golden. Look at this thick line. How how do you develop the balls to I know. allow yourself to do that? And it works, man. I, it's perfect. I guess the fact that you have all this, like, black behind it is kind of like... Like, if you had that up against white, You'd be like, am I going to get drummed out of the business? <laughs> so this is, I guess this was drawn as like a thing or, you know, and then cut. There's like... Yeah, there's a paste up of our... Paste up, yeah. Foreground elements. This this whole look is like, you know, heavy metal uh, album cover <laughs> kind of stuff. Golden's really gelling with Milgram here. Yeah. They're, they're starting to get some comfort with one another. Mm -hmm. And that could be golden tightening pencils it could be milgram i mean kind of vibing more with with what golden's presenting him teams have a chemistry you know and and sometimes it it, it takes a while for it for it to like really get into full mode it's a bit, bit confusing that image <laughs> yes yeah. pretty badass <laughs> that is like pinball back glass or something yeah that toy was like it was like this japanese character called steel jig and he was like green, red, like all these, uh, you know, crazy colors. And he had a pet horse robot and then they could combine. And then when they brought it to America, Star Wars had just come out and they, they kind of Darth Vadered him up. I have to see what the, uh, what the final printed version of this looks like, because that feels straight up like a font. Yeah. No, I mean that those are, those are the letters. Yeah. yeah like that's, this is different the, from that one. Yeah, those are the letters in the comic. And this, like, last issue has a ton of, like, overlays. and Like, they get, you know, pretty experimental with this, like, final issue. Yeah, like, all this stuff would be, like, these weird uh, color holds and things. Yeah, this is wild shit. I just know that it's not... We're looking, we're looking at something that's being doctored. Right, yeah. That's a little weird. For an artist edition. For an artist edition, sure. Yeah. It just it just deviates from the norm. I, I like it. Mm -hmm. But I but I a part of getting these artist editions, I want to know the story behind the story, and that could be as simple as like what kind of brush, you know, did the person use or did they use a sponge to ink this texture? Like that part, it just leaves it opens more questions up. What do we think we have here, man? Is that xerography? Yeah. Uh, that's inverted and pasted up? Yeah, because in the comic this is kind of weird. Like it doesn't quite work. In the comic, this, yeah. I think this is like blue or something. In the comic, um, this this artist edition though, like you think about the budget for this thing and, and what they expect. You know, you got like the Mazzucchelli edition had some cool, uh, you know, a, vellum the, the vellum and stuff, and and then it was a different company, but like the Dark Knight Returns one and stuff. It's like you go into those kind of projects and you kind of have a sense of what the thing might sell. With this, this stuff's been out of print like since 
the 80s. Like, yeah. since they did those Baxter reprints, weird rights stuff involved. So it might have been a lot of money up front just to be able to even get this thing going. And then because there's no real track record, it's not like it's a perennial seller just because of those legal reasons. They can't be like, you know what? The Micronauts, you know, collection gets this much, you know, sells for this much. And, and, and you know, you have less data going in. Like, it's, it's yeah. a big question mark making this. Yeah, it's all about Michael Golden as the sales yeah. metric. These are Mego toys. Mego, yeah. So it's is that before, like, the big, tall superhero figures in tandem? Uh, Mego is the big, tall superhero. Like, Mego well, was... That's, well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, like uh, were these coming out when the... the Planet of the Apes figures and shit like that. Was yeah, this of... this is like after like like Mego had done that stuff. That was like the past of Mego and 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 maybe a little bit of the present when when this was this was like late seventies. That other stuff was like early to mid seventies. Yeah, and and Mego just like dominated toys at that point. Had and all the licenses. Had, almost had like fu- almost like Funko. The way that yeah. was like you know Hellboy Funko Pop next to a Captain America next to a Superman. They basically owned toys and and boys toys and stuff. And then they passed on Star Wars. Yeah, that was like the one thing that, and then and then that was like their undoing. I mean, I think there was other. That's what this is. Know, yeah, you know, like it's mm-hmm. it's that same scale, and and Star Wars kind of brought in that three and a quarter inch s- scale. Yeah, yeah. This because uh, like, everything else was it was a Barbie doll beforehand. Well, the Micronauts were like they were a Japanese toy called Micro Man that yeah. they brought here. So it was like. It way predates Star Wars, and and there, it's even tied in with like GI Joe. Also, like it's it, it's like a whole convoluted history of yeah. Well, Microman, that's, that's Transformers. Um, yeah, Microman beca- becomes Diaclone, becomes Transformers. Yeah. yeah, it's it's super cool when when you look at this stuff. And for the Micronauts toys in America, w- we kind of got like a fraction of what the, you know the Japanese market had, and then they probably would have continued with like you know Diaclone or Transformers or whatever, but. Uh, but Mego was out of business, so you know, has their their losses, Hasbro's gain. So interesting to think about, like like these marks. These are this is post Kirby Marvel marks, and mm-hmm. then and then more of this will be uh, imbued into like future cartoonist works. It, yeah, it's just it's just fun to imagine how the stuff evolves. Yeah, and and what you pick up on, like as a young artist, because this this wasn't formative stuff for me. I encountered all this stuff as an adult. And, uh, but like those guys, like the image guys growing up with this, how, how it, uh, you know, and so we're getting the covers and, and the covers are, and then we even have covers of like, uh, future issues. future issues. Cause he, he, he stays on as cover artist, you know, well after he's finished as, as like the interior artist. These are like the, this is like the Chaken where, where Chaken does like a two parter and, uh. Real cool to see him doing some some uh, real Marvel characters. Yeah, the last issue of like the last Michael Golden issue of Micronauts kind of ends with this teaser where you see like Nick Fury step out of the darkness, and then you I think maybe you see the Fantastic Four, or there's like a reference to the Fantastic Four, and it's like oh shit, things are about to get good, <laughs> and, and then they don't. Love seeing the color holds like like that makes so much sense to us, right? Like you just mm-hmm. know that that would be like a blue line. Yeah, and it and it makes perfect sense. This is interesting. I'd like to see how Golden shakes this out because I could see him being adventurous enough to have like double plates to make like a purple, mm-hmm, right, and a red and yeah. stuff. And, and but I have to take a look at that cover. I'm very curious. Yeah, these covers, like you know, it's it like Michael Golden gets to do kind of like the whole story in like one image, you know, and you kind of you kind of wish that you know he'd stuck with the book and you'd get to see like what what that story would have been. At first, his hands. at first, I was thinking, "Oh, this is cool. This is like an interesting, different, new way to convey energy." Mm-hmm. But I, these are like structural. Yeah, that's the planet. That's that's the uh, Micronauts world. It's called Home World, and it's it's yeah, like a, a, a protein chain or something with like little cities built on it. So good. I love these these uh, covers where we have the scale at play because mm-hmm. this doesn't nothing communicates micro when you have yeah. this, but when you have these elements. You know, giant truck, tiny figures, playing with some op art, Serenko mm-hmm. style. Yeah, and this is when the um, the series starts to uh, go in, like um, Nick Fury and stuff start to show up. So, so I think some of that's deliberate too. Like, Makes okay, sense. we're getting into Nick Fury, Serenko territory. The little uh, the corner box. Corner box. Yeah, love it. It's cool to see the size, right? You've never seen it that size, you know. <laughs> and yeah, just seeing seeing this color. This is a good package, man. Yeah, really, really is nice. And um, like all through the series, there were 
like you know these great like pinups and then like little character shots a lot a lot of cool you know and and the the ads for it yeah that's our uh end papers looking at this stuff i mean a lot of golden's early work from this area it screams uh fanzine to me yeah and this feels like fanzine mm -hmm. this this feels like iconic or that or that maybe there's something else i've seen maybe something with like X-Men and yeah. mutants or something yeah. that, that this influenced, but that feels iconic, even if it's not that specific image. And then this is the cover that Golden drew for issue one, and then they ended up not using it. They they I, I forget who did the cover. And then this is like, yeah, those like character shots. You know, like here's this when they're like trying to introduce this this new universe. That's beautiful. Yeah. Several different zips put in there man we have a grainy one we have this level of grayscale and then we have the the fade the macro knots i don't, I don't know if this is like some kind of joke or something or... <laughs> how much would that suck man if you put all this work in and turn it into like a mic it's micro knots <laughs> oh wait a second el hama michael golden that's cool yeah Larry Hama, he says he's a penciler who writes writes comics. Yeah, I always like when they um, run his, like, they'll do variant covers for even, like, the current G.I. Joe comics. And, like, there'll be a Larry Hama variant. And I just, I love his art. So we're back to issue one. So this is issue one. So, yeah, if you're, like, reading this as a thing, you got to go to the back of the back matter and then see issue one. They're really putting in some work, man. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I ever really thought about it that much. But looking at... It's the way Rubenstein kind of softens the edges. There's a there's a there's a rights in softness in mm -hmm. in that yeah. and and a attention to lighting that feels very rights in ish or or like the studio in general. Yeah, Gold, Golden feels like he's adjacent to to rights in. You know, there's there's a commonality there. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and they are like this wasn't like a conventional approach or a conventional look to a you know comic of this era like they were you know kind of like inventing a lot and you know feeling their way it's it's pretty exciting like i could see how a kid around this time would be like really excited by something that just looked this different Sa same as Im the image guys you yeah know? yeah and and you know just like for ourselves growing up what made me gravitate toward the image guys was the simple fact that it wasn't how style John Buscema knockoff yeah. kind of like you had all of that shit and then you had the stuff that just just by virtue of looking different mm -hmm. uh, be, made the stuff become interesting it's what makes the, the Snake Eyes action figure from the original run right the breakout hit yeah yeah everybody's one thing and then here's something that's completely different you know th just the the way of drawing the, the flourishes and stuff you know feel, it feels like Vaughn Baudet or something like it, it feels youthful you know <laughs> this stuff right here man <laughs> is what uh, it's interesting to see how like Art Adams interpreted these yeah. into his own practice, and then the image guys take from Art Adams the little screen door, like it, you know this shit, mm -hmm. just just a way to break up space. Yeah, it's just kind of like graphically impressive. Yeah, really cool panel layouts here. Yeah, I like that. I I, I think I might have copied that on something. It's very thoughtful. Damn, and then I look at this and I think of, like, Manhunter, Simonson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were, like, a lot of exciting things going on in, in the 70s, and sort of, like, the, the old hands weren't as sensitive to it as, like, the young guys coming in. But then you think about it, it's just, like, five guys, really, yeah, when, you, right. when you break it down. there There's, there's like, a real, you know, there's, there's something really cool going on here. Oh, yeah. The attention to lighting is huge. <laughs> and then there's yeah. just this, this wild shit. It makes me wonder, did, did he see manga? I mean, it must be. I mean, you know, manga, or maybe, like, the way that manga started out as, like, an interpretation of, like, Disney-style animation. This is, you know, his interpretation of Disney-style animation designs. But, I mean, like, you know, uh, you know, Gigantor and... and uh, There's stuff in syndication. You know, stuff. Yeah, it, it, it's sure. on TV when, when they're kids. Yeah. Man, that's some some major tears. That's, Porridge, yeah. Porridge coming out. <laughs> wow, that's a crazy screen. There are these screens like when when 
Zipatone was available in art stores, there would be the different classifications mm -hmm. and different price structures. And there would inevitably be, like, say, the $1 uh, yeah. screens. And it would be this kind of shit. It's and like I would, a quilt or something. And I would always wonder, like, how can you make use of that? Yeah. And it's always cool to see how people do make use of uh, those non-traditional, non, you know, dot pattern screens. I was always surprised there wasn't, like, more of this kind of thing in in uh, Micronauts, you know, where they're, like, squaring off with, like, a house cat or something. I mean, like, as a as a kid, like, I had those ideas and thoughts. Yeah. You know, like, I had so many action figures and toy play sets, and I remember thinking, man, it would be cool to be able to be that size and actually use the fire pole in the Ghostbusters headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> but then your mind starts to wander, and it's like, yeah, dude. Your little your puppy might not be uh, good for your health. <laughs> when they start going Minotaur, that's a little much. <laughs> that's that's where that's, you're that's, out. That's a bridge too far. Uh huh. That that's when it's it's getting into Narnia territory. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're getting a little too Tolkien. Well, it's kind of cool in in story terms because for this guy, it was like you know the whole world is like it's body banks. Uh, you know, surgery, genetic, you know, interchangeable parts. And this is almost like a, a way to torture him or punish him. They're like, uh, we're really going to fuck you up. We're going to, you know, merge your, your body with a, with a, a horse. <laughs> and then he's kind of like stuck that way. <laughs> Where Baron Karza, he's, it's more of like a cyborg horse he can like pop in and out of. It's, it's not a bummer for him. I wonder what the pace up was there. Something was on, over top of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this ended up being like a color. Okay. Okay, I was gonna say, what does that final printed page look like? Because it's like it's like he's like merging his mind with that planet, and and then this is uh, like a, a stat of this panel yeah. shrunken down. Yeah, and that is a stat. This is the era of the stat. Mm -hmm. You know, that that cost two dollars to make in nineteen seventy six or eight or whatever. It's funny seeing like all the signatures from time to time on the pages where it's like, okay, somebody bought this. Got him to sign it. Yeah. Did they buy it from him and he signed it? Did they buy it somewhere else and then bring it to him at a show to sign? Yeah, some of the stuff is uh, has people's names on it. Super cool. Man. I, I like the back end papers. It's pretty nice. Nice shot. And this is probably what inspires uh, Art Adams to date all of his work. Mm -hmm. Um. So he did commercial art for for a minute before popping into comics. That makes sense because of his knowledge of production. Yeah, having those like tools and things. Um, I just there's just one before we wrap it up. There's like one page I wanted to back up to because I, I think we passed it. But like, it was like when I was looking through here, um, for the first time, this little guy over here in in this corner really jumps out at like. He looks so Miller-esque here. So, like, Ronin-era totally. Miller. And it's, you know... You're so right. I wonder if this is still a... Uh, it's Micronauts 1. Yeah, it's Micronauts so number that, 1. So, so it's like, Joseph 1979. Rub yeah, that's Joseph Rubenstein. Yeah. And Rubenstein inked that Wolverine miniseries. Right. So I wonder if Frank appreciated some of the ticks and marks that Rubenstein brought to the game. Yeah, because those kind of marks feel like something Miller would do when he's drawing like a samurai or something. So that, that could, for, for all we know, could, could very well be in that, that uh, Wolverine thing. Super cool, man. Pleasure to look at this thing. This, uh, when, when this did come out, it went pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I jumped on it. I'm like, you know, most artist editions aren't enough to get me to like pull the trigger, but this one is like, I got, I got to get this one. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun, man. Tom, thanks for bringing it over. And uh, we'll get out of here, man. Kayfabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. What's out there, man? Uh, check out uh, Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, Fantastic Four Grand Design. Uh, go to my Patreon and check out my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue one, two, three, and I believe issue four are on the stands as we speak. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. Every issue is completely self-contained. It's banned in close to 30 countries it's banned in more than 10 comic shops but you can order and pre-order those comics at my link tree in the description below this video you can also hit my patreon up uh, for the price of three dollars you get access to the archive more than 200 pages worth of stuff and i put up new strips every tuesday uh jimmy and i have a cartoonist kayfabe 
uh, spread shop where we sell merchandise, hats, shirts, things like that. Uh, we are going to be going to Heroes Con at the end of June. We want to see a lot of Cartoonist Cafe merchandise in the wild, man. When we had just 5,000 subscribers, we saw over 100 shirts representing Kayfabe. I got to see 1,000 when we're down there this time. Tom, since you're co-host uh, here today, man, why don't you give these guys their marching orders? We'll be on our way. Read more comics.